Father, we just thank you for this space on a Sunday morning. It's an honor to be here. I thank you that we can come together as a community, worship you in song and uh, by word. Father, I just pray the Holy Spirit here to speak to us, to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, so we're in a series that I'm calling the James Club. Uh, it's in the book of James, so if you have your Bible, if you want a physical copy, there are some Bibles in the back row. Thomas would be glad to give you a Bible uh, to follow, around, follow along, otherwise uh, the text will be on the PowerPoint. So this is, uh, we're in chapter 3. This is a series that I've been doing, uh, really tying in the foundations of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, the Bible and where a lot of these concepts come from and really what do they mean. And so uh, basically talking about a life of faith, a faith in Jesus, a belief in Jesus and how that changes uh, your actions and, um, and, and your whole life and the trajectory of your life. And so we've kind of got into the metrics of it. Uh, if you are a business owner, you need to know metrics. You need to know like if things are successful. And so I find uh, this part in James and uh, a little bit of last week is really a good sign of where is my faith really at? Where am I really at? Where is John Ruby really at? Uh, and, and so this is another uh, lesson of the metric of the grace of God in your life, of the good news in your life, of the acceptance of Jesus in your life, that he died so that you may have life. And so it's a great metric to know if you have a life. And I don't mean like in the cool kids club, I mean a life in eternity with Jesus. Uh, I know working, uh, when I first started my service with God and to others, I worked at a mentally ill home. Uh, a care home, it was, it was literally the best job I ever had. I've never had a job where uh, the, the people, the employment, all the people were looking out the window waiting for me. And it was like, you know, it was like, it was amazing to be accepted into this family. And they all counted on me, like, to feed them and, and give them medication. And we would watch a Blue Jay game or we would go to Dairy Queen. And it was like this family atmosphere. And one of the commonalities that they had was this unassurance, this doubt that they would spend eternity with God. And so there was a lot of reassurances. There was a lot of, you know, praying for them. There was a lot of casting out doubt and, and, and just giving them hope. And so I believe that maybe a lot of us throughout our day, we could have those same doubts and those same questions. So this, my friends, is a metric, a measurement of, of where your heart really is. Because a lot of us know that maybe our reality isn't necessarily the real reality. Or maybe your reality is always the real reality. All right, so this is called Taming of the Tongue. James 1, James 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers. Uh-oh, that's me. That's a... Okay, so this is talking to me for a second. You guys talk amongst yourself. Pa, pay attention. Neil, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Be able to keep, be able to keep their whole body in check. And so James is coming out and saying that they're the, the people that communicate, the, the people that uh, have... The, the ability and the privilege to teach the word of God, to be a messenger of God, have a higher standard, have a, have a measurement. And, and, and it might not seem fair. It might not, like, why do I get treated differently? It's, it's just not fair. And what I realized in, in my early recovery from drugs and alcohol in 2005, and as I engaged in service to God and to others at Jericho Road, uh, ministries and started uh, working at the care home with mentally ill people. It was fun. It was a. It, it, it was just a party. And then I started. I, I had the privilege of working with addicts 
and, and, and recovery people because I'm one of those. And, and so building a house of recovery and discipleship and, and uh, what we have now is a, an addiction treatment center. And, and all of a sudden, I had this spotlight on John Ruby. And I'm like, I just want to be one of the boys. I just want to have fun. I want to crack some jokes. I want, I, and, and I was set at this higher standard. And people would tell my boss, oh, John Ruby did this. And John, John Ruby swore at me. <laughs> John Ruby yelled at me. John Ruby said, I'm no good, go to the mission. And you know the words get twisted around, and maybe the word the mission was in there, but, but, but it's because you're not listening. You might end up at the mission. And, and so there was this, this transition of, of, of responsibility, and it wasn't in my teaching. It wasn't in my communicating it was in my character. It was in who I was and becoming that new creation. And I had all these critics in front of me every day. I had a beautiful 10 of them usually. And as soon as I come in, they have the sheet. Oh, John was a little bit late. Wow, that was an hour lunch he took. Huh. And it was like, as a leader, I had this higher standard. And so that's what James is saying. It's not this higher standard of, oh, you're so gifted in your speech and your teaching presentation, but it's more about that character and the transformed life by the belief in Jesus. I think of uh, the, the overweight gym teacher, and he's teaching you how to jump and get in shape, and it's like, really, really, okay. you got to get in shape yourself is, is what we're talking about. <clears throat> I see the word stumble. And, and that word stumble is really talking about to trip and to get up, to, to stub your toe and, and keep on going. Not to like fall down and lay on the ground and say, like, I, I can't take it anymore. It means to progress and not perfection. It means we all stumble. We're not going to be perfect and, 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 and that's okay. But a teacher must be blameless. And, and me as a teacher right now in front of you, I want to pass that on to you guys. It's a gift. You need to be blameless as well. And when I look at blameless, I, you think of this word, it's like, I can't reach that. that that's blameless. Like, that's perfection. And, and I think the way I see it is to be blameless as in, you can't blame me for anything because I already told on myself. I already came and said, hey, I'm sorry for talking to you like that. I'm sorry for, you know, like, it's all me time and my time. I'm, I want to be blameless. I don't want to uh, hide anything. I don't want there to be secrets in my life. And, and I think that can apply to all of us. It's not to, you know, have fault in you and then cover it up and then have guilt and shame and, and then remorse and resentment. And, and, and to me, that's a fall. And, 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 and some of us in this room, when we're in that place, when we're not being open and honest and sharing and, and blameless, we go and drink. We go and do drugs. We end up in jail. And it's, it, that's a fall. That's not a stumble. It's okay to stumble. All right, so we get to this new metric, and this is uh, the metric of the heart. We looked at we looked at uh, a week or two weeks ago, and and a few weeks ago about the belief in Jesus. It was faith without works is dead. So the metric was on works. It's if you have a belief system. If you believe something, your actions will tell us really what you believe. And now. James is saying what you believe in, your belief system, uh, it will come out in your actions. And what we looked at, your belief, the work of God was to believe in the one that he sent, to believe in Jesus, that he died for you to give you life. And how are you living that? And it will come out in your actions. And now James is giving you one more metric. And he says, your mouth, your words, will show us really what's in your heart. Words are a big deal. I'm reminded of Revelations. We have an enemy, and we overcome the enemy by the power of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, and the word of our testimony. 
The, the words are very important. In, in Mark 8, Jesus says to Peter, he rebukes Peter. Like one of the 12, Peter, like Jesus' head guys. And he says, get behind me, Satan, because of Peter's words. You do not have the mind, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So he was really pointing out, like, Peter, you don't really know who I am. You don't really know what I've come to do. You don't really believe in, you don't even know who I really am. Our words end up showing what is in our hearts. James 3, verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Has anybody driven? Has anybody ridden? Riding? Rid. Has, <laughs> has anybody rid a horse? There's not very many horse riders. Everybody knows the language of riding, but there are so, they're amazing animals. They're big. They're bigger than me. And I need help. I, I remember the first time I went horse riding, horseback riding, okay? And, and I needed help to get up. And then there's this little ladder that hangs and dangles, and then I had to hoist myself over. And then the horse was like, oh, I'm going to go this way. And I'm like, I was nervous. And it's not very safe up there. And then you get to learn how to steer it. And they're pretty good. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing because the reality of this, how much does the horse weigh? All the horse people here. What? 2,000? I like 2,000. We'll go with 2,000. A ton. A ton. That's a big, that's a Clydesdale now. I was not riding a Clydesdale. But there, I, I have no power over that 2,000 pound animal. There's nothing that, if it wanted to hit me, hoof me, like I, I, I can't even run faster than it. And all of a sudden, I can get on top of this animal and steer it. And it was amazing. Just a little tug and a little tug like that and a, a little whoa. And you have total control over this animal. It's amazing. And then take ships as an example. Although they, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they steer by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. He's comparing these things that a human has no, you can't stop a boat. You can't stop the waves and the wind that blow the boat. You can't stop a 2,000 pound animal from doing whatever it wants except if you have this tiny little rudder and these, a little bit with reins in their mouths. The tongue, where was that? Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. And it's like James is comparing a horse, a big, massive horse, a ship, and a fire. And, and I don't know if you've watched the news ever and, and out in the BC fires. And, and once a fire gets going, it can take a whole mountain range down. And, and so he's comparing your tongue to the ability to have unleash this power without any control. What or whom or if anything is holding your reins or your rudder? I thought, is your emotions holding your rudder? Maybe you don't, maybe you know somebody like that. And maybe their emotions, your feelings, your reactions, you're reacting at everything. Well, life circumstances, you're being consumed by them because your emotions are holding your reins or your rudder. Your intellect, how you figure things out, how you provide, your finances, your, your status, what people think of you. Is that holding the trajectory of your life? Or is it your past hurts? And, and, and your, your mistakes, is that what is steering the course of your life? Ask yourself that. Who's holding my rudder today?
Is it belief in Jesus? Because when we looked at works, we looked at the word works and the work of God is to believe in the one that the Father sent. Belief in Jesus. If, if that's the core of who you are, your mouth will be a metric to say that Jesus holds your rudder. And I thought some of you are like, I can bypass this a little bit. I can keep my mouth shut. I'm really good at that. I'm not good at that. But maybe I'm horrible at that. Like sometimes I get mad. I get mad at Nana or, you know, like when I grew up and got married and I got mad. I'm like, I'm not going to talk to, I'm not, I'm not going to say a thing. And that lasts for a very short time. So if you're that person that can have silence and go like, oh, there's a loophole. I can just keep my mouth shut. That's a good metric of a rudder. Oh, I didn't argue. I didn't talk back. But at the same time, I didn't encourage. I didn't build. Oh, but I didn't tear down. But I didn't connect. I isolated. You don't lock up a horse or a boat that won't steer properly. It's like, well, take this horse back to the back 40. Back 40, people know what that is. <laughs> Paul used to say that all the time. We'll take you back to the back 40. And then I've like learned. I'm like, oh, to shoot me and put me down. Thanks, Pa. Like, get well. Like, that was sick. We'll take you to the back 40. Stop complaining. <laughs> if a horse won't act properly or a boat won't steer properly, you don't write it off. You don't just say, hey, what's the point? Ah, let's go fix it. Let's not just silence it. Although one thing that I have found, and this is just a tip for everyone, I always look around for my wife. Hey, she's not here. I say that sometimes, and then she's there, and she... Silence can be a good thing in marriage sometimes. For all you new merely, newlyweds. For a bit. Ships and horses to fire. Sticks and stones. Remember that one? Sticks and stones, children, destroy. Proverbs 26, 18, like a madman who throws firebands, arrows, and death is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and there is no whisper, quarreling ceases, as charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. And so James is saying, like, words is a, like a, a major metric on where your heart really is. It, are you just saying, my heart's been transformed by Jesus. Oh, my life is so great. Everything's fine. And then you're spewing, and then you're this and you're that. And so the metric of your mouth will tell you what's in your heart. James 3, verse 7. All kinds of animals, <coughs> birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Oh my goodness. He's saying like, there is no hope. You can't do this. Good luck. And I've seen, I've literally seen a dolphin kiss a person. Like a dolphin is like a shark kind of. And it's like they've got, <laughs> they're similar. If you're swimming in the ocean and you see a dolphin, you're going to scream and jump out of the water. So they're very similar in looks. <laughs> what was the point of that? Anyway, there's a dolphin. I've seen a dolphin kiss a person. Like, that's impossible. Like, I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't know where training begins. I have a miniature pincher, a dog, and I can't even train it to walk. Like, without pulling, I can't train it to... But you can train a beast of a sea. You can train killer whales. You can train lions and bears. I, there was a movie, and this guy got like trapped in a canyon, and he cut off his own arm. And, and he made, I forget the details of the movie, but it was like, like 100 hours. I think it was called 100 hours. 100 and how many? I gave him last credit, I'm sorry, 127. He cut off his arm. And like, that's a big deal. Like, that guy, you should figure he could tame his tongue. 
the, the guy that trained the, the dolphin to kiss, he should have some ability to train his little tongue. <clears throat> but no human can tame the tongue. Only the heart can tame the tongue. A heart changed through a relationship with Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a journey that you can't really do <clears throat> on your own. A woman <clears throat> came to John Wesley once and she said, I know what my talent is, pastor. Hey, pastor, I know what my talent is. And she said, I think my talent is from God is to speak my mind. Wesley replied, I don't think God would mind if you buried that one. And, and I remember myself in that same situation. I, I have, I have uh, the gift of boldness, if you, if you know me or have interacted with me. And I'm not scared to, you know, be a mirror for you and, and tell you some hard things. And I thought I was really good at this. This is, this is a gifting. And I remember, oh, I can make so many people cry, especially, you know, women. And, and it's like, you know, I just tell them like it is. And, and this one girl that we had dinner with, and, I, you know, I was helping her. And, and she was crying, and finally she just got so angry and said, John, Rebbe, you're like, you're like a surgeon that doesn't use anesthesia. And I was like, I'm like a surgeon. Oh, that's, no one likes that surgeon. <laughs> no one's going there. There's no gas. There's no whatever they do. That's not good. So what's really in my heart, right? Judgment, criticism, harshness. Verse 9, the tongue will praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He's saying if you got olives, you don't have a fig tree. And if you're drinking salty water, you might want to change the source. Some of us think we have fresh water. Some of us are like, here, have some of my water. It's great. It's life-giving. And people are spitting it out. Because it's salty. I love promises. And, and that's a, a great metric. And, and so Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and the, this, the, the, the gospel story, the healing journey of, of a relationship with Jesus is exactly the same as the process of the Alcoholics Anonymous big book where we go into a time of admission and, and acceptance and confession and forgiveness and repentance. And, and so this book says, if you do all these things, there's going to be some promises. There's going to be some metrics. And, and here's some promises. And it's the, the same as everyone in here. A lot of us have come in hopeless and, and been through the ringer and got mud on our shoes and, and maybe not, don't wear the right clothes to the right place and, and, and we're just beat up and we want a new hope. We're hopeless. And so we introduce you to a relationship with Jesus. And so it's, it's the same idea. We can say, I've accepted Jesus. And, and the work of God... Faith without works is dead. The work of God is to believe in the one that he sent him. But that belief has to turn into action. And so here are some promises. I love these promises. You will know a new freedom and a happiness. You won't regret the past. You won't live in the past. You won't be consumed by the past. You'll know peace. You will see how your past and experiences can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness, that feeling of fear and self-pity will disappear. Hey, you will gain interest in other people. Selfishness will slip away. Your whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and finances will leave you. You'll know how to handle situations. You will realize 
that it's not by your power, but it's by God's power. And a belief in Jesus will transform your life. So if those things are in your life, you can go, okay, that's a good metric. I've accepted Jesus' death. His death has given me life and hope. And these things are starting to be true in my life. My actions are starting to change because I love volunteering. I like helping other people. All this kind of stuff, I, 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 I give my money to God. I want to straighten out my finances. I want to straighten out relationships. All these things start to change. And finally, the metric of a changed heart will be shown in action and confirmed what comes out of your mouth. And so if you look at a relationship with Jesus and the transformation power of the Holy Spirit, when your spirit connects to God's spirit, there's some fruit of the spirit, it's called. There's joy and love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And I guarantee if those things are a part of your life and in your heart and, and the foundation of who you are, it will come out of your mouth. Because you won't be criticizing. You, you look at the positive in people. And I don't mean being fake. I mean like seeing the, the three good things in, in somebody or a place or whatever and not always looking at the 20 bad things. Or, or looking at the three positive things in your own life and not consumed by your past and by the hurt and by the bad things in your life. If your life really has changed It'll change in your actions, and it'll change in your words. It's contrary to envy. If these things are in your life, envy, lust, greed, self-centeredness, control, harshness, intimidating, divisiveness, and gossip. If those things are in your life, it's going to come out in your words. And, and I think we can be nice to each other on a Sunday. It's like, how, hello, have some sausage and some pineapple. It's great to see you. Have a coffee. Let's sing some songs. But then when you get home or on the ride home, you start to argue because you're in close proximity. And it's the closest people that really bring out what's really in your heart. Control and anger and jealousy and rage and envy, all those things. Have your, has your life really been transformed by the gospel, by a relationship with Jesus? Because you're Sputing, spouting, spouting, poison, as he puts it, with your mouth. And you're hurting the closest people next to you. You're nice when you go to work. Hi, chums. Thanks for the paycheck. Love you. Right? You're nice to people that you're trying to impress. But to the closest people, your children, your parents, your Partner, <laughs> siblings, <laughs> I see your mouth will tell you really what's in your heart. Whew. Out of my mouth pours salt water or fresh water, destruction or life. So this is just a metric of the transformed life. And, and I think it's important that you see that you do have a mirror sometimes. Because at the end of this life, it does matter where you go. Because you are going somewhere. Right? That's what the Bible says. You got two options. And so how, how am I assured that I have eternity in heaven with my Father? Well, I, I, I have a belief in Jesus that he died so I may be alive, that I can have communion with my Father in heaven, the Creator. And then through that belief and, and relationship, my actions will change. And, and finally, you'll really see the change in, in, in my words. So are your words salt water? Or are they fresh water? Are they destruction or are they life? And I'm going to get you guys to do a little exercise with me. I call it listening prayer. And uh, we do this every second Wednesday. 
Uh, we get to worship God and, and hear God. And as, as his sheep, his sheep need to hear his voice. So I, I find it, um, I've, I feel that we have to practice. And, and in my, my perception, prayer was always this really mundane, monotonous thing where you just talk and talk and talk. And that's what children do. They talk and talk and talk. But as adults, as people that mature, we really need to listen. And, and we hear voices all day long. We hear our own voice all day long. And, and sometimes that voice can be very negative and critical and, and all that stuff. And I really feel that we really need to hear God's voice. And so I just want to practice that right now. And so I'm just going to ask God a question. And you can close your eyes. You can open your eyes. You can, you can do whatever you want. However you feel that you can receive the voice of God. And, and I don't think you have to have a standard of of, of spirituality, you know, God, God has spoken through a donkey. God has spoken through a burning bush. And, and he, he has spoken to me on a seven-day bender, clear as a bell in my head. And so he can talk to you right here and right now. So as I ask this question, would you please ask yourself the question? Because I think um, the point of having a relationship with Jesus is not for what you can do for him, but what he can do and, and heal in your heart. Like I said, like, like James said, you can't do this. You can't tame your tongue. You can't, this isn't something that you can do easily. So I want to invite God into this. And so maybe there's something right now that he wants you to look at. All right. Father, where am I or have been causing fires with my words? Holy Spirit, we just ask you to speak to us, whether we're super close to you or far from you. We know you are real and that you can speak to us. Father, speak to us. So the question is, and you can pray this to yourself, Father, where am I or have I been causing fires with my words? And maybe he can show you where division is, or where judgment is, or where bitterness is, envy, or fear, resentments. Father, where have I been causing fires? <clears throat> 